My name is Bond. James Bond. James Bond. my little octopus. Enjoy yourself. British secret agent James Bond 007 goes undercover for what turns out to be a high-flying mission which leads to a dramatic conclusion. Elsewhere in East Berlin, a mystery is unfolding involving a murdered British agent dressed up as a clown and a priceless Fabergé egg. Except it's a fake. James Bond follows a lead to Sotheby's where the original egg is being auctioned only to discover the sinister Kamal Khan who seems hell-bent to win the priceless egg at any cost. Kamal wins the bidding war, but James Bond has pulled a fast one, and now holds the real priceless egg. James Bond follows Kamal to India, where he meets his contact, VJ, who leads him to the location of Kamal Khan, where James Bond challenges Kamal to a game of backgammon with some really high stakes. Bond beats Kamal at his own game, but Kamal doesn't take it all well as his goons is sent after Bond, but he and VJ give them the slip. The two arrive at Q Branch, where they pick up a few gadgets, including a homing device, which Q places inside the priceless egg. James Bond returns to his hotel to find the lovely Magda waiting for him, and after an evening of making some memories, Magda steals the original Fabergé egg, and Bond is taken in. James Bond is held at Kamal's palace, and after a most unusual dinner, Bond escapes and tracks the egg, leading him to a secret meeting between Kamal and the warmongering Russian General Orlov. James Bond escapes but then finds himself to be human prey in a jungle manhunt. After overcoming a few jungle obstacles, James Bond manages to give them the slip. Bond follows his next lead to a remote island inhabited only by women, where he meets the mysterious octopusy. The two discover they already have an instant connection, and Bond spends some time on the island getting to know Octopussy and her operation. But their time together is cut short. Bond fights off the attackers but uses the opportunity to slip away, where he then finds that his contact VJ has been cut down. Bond follows a lead to Berlin, where he infiltrates the Octopussy Circus. While in deep disguise, James Bond discovers the real plan between Orlov and Kamal, the detonation of a nuclear device on an American Air Force base. James Bond escapes and fights off several attackers, and then it's a race against time to get to the base before it's too late. James Bond arrives at the circus but has to go undercover. Chaos erupts, but James Bond manages to defuse the bomb with only seconds to spare. Octopussy and her women return to India to confront Kamal, but a battle erupts. James Bond along with Q arrive to save the day, but Kamal escapes, holding Octopussy as hostage, but Bond is hot on his trail. And after a high-flying aerial battle, James Bond overcomes Kamal's henchmen, rescues Octopussy in the nick of time, leaving Kamal to meet his fate. And James Bond and Octopussy sail off into the sunset. Written by George McDonald Frazier, Richard Maybaum, and Michael Wilson. Directed by John Glenn. 1983's Octopussy. Here yes, in, we go. Yes, indeed. And uh, 1983 was kind of an interesting year if you were a Bond fan because they also had a competing film, Never Say Never Again, yep. which starred, as everyone probably knows, Sean Connery. It was the Battle of the Bonds. Right. And uh, this was the long-rumored um, remake of Thunderball from Kevin McClory. Um, which was uh, it was called James Bond of the Secret Service, yes, and then it was, it was called Warhead, and then finally Never Say Never Again. And the crazy thing was that they were going to release both these films almost like at the same time, almost the same week, um, which would have been, I think, a disaster. 
you know, to have them both mm. release at the same time. But Never Say Never yeah. Again ran into post-production problems, so they extended their date a few months out. And uh, Octopus Sea kind of ruled the summer box office. Yeah, and, and thank God because, like you said, if if, if it was if it was literally the same time, it could have been. It, it frankly could have killed the franchise, really, because if you, <laughs> you got to cancel each other out, you know. You know, yeah. the, all the old school Bond fans would have said, "What? I got? I could choose now between Moore and Connery. I'll go see Connery, not knowing yeah. whether the movie's any good or whatever." Um, so yeah, yeah. Whew. <laughs> yeah, and at the time, I mean, it wasn't, you know, the internet wasn't as prevalent, it wasn't even really an, an internet yet, and um, didn't really, most people didn't know that it was a remake of Thunderball, they just thought it was another, you know, Sean Connery yeah. adventure, you know, that, no, a lot of people didn't, really, I don't yeah. think really got that whole, you know, yeah. all the background stuff of the Kevin McClory legal battle. I remember I used to get this uh, magazine called Starlog. Uh, which was sort of like, you know, my, I had that. <laughs> right. I was like, sort of like, you know, my internet back then, you know, about what was going on in science fiction and fantasy movies and so forth. And they used to uh, cover James Bond films. And I remember they had, you know, both Roger Moore and Sean Connery in the cover and it was Battle of the Bonds, you know? Yeah. Yep. yep. But, but I guess right, we should I zero in on Octopussy here. Yeah. Let's talk about the clear winner, I think. I mean, I think any sane person would say. Um, Octopussy, and no secret, this has been, it was my first Bond in a theater. Really? And, yep, my first theater-going experience, and honestly, it's it was easily the film that pulled me into the whole James Bond phenomenon. I think it was literally the summer, I mean, it came out in 83, so it was the summer of 84, it was on cable all summer long i'm on summer vacation from school it's on constantly i'm watching it every time it's on um and i'm just loving the hell out of it and to this day i think it is by far the most underrated bond film in the whole franchise i'm not saying it's the best film but easily the most underrated and i and i i I, it blows my mind when i see it show up but i'll i'll see like these stupid you know, ranking every James Bond film from like just kind of totally random websites. Octopus, he always ends up on the way bottom. It does. And they love yeah. to mention, they love to talk about, oh, it's the one where you're dressed up like a clown. Either that or they I, reference the Tarzan yell. And I, I've always kind yeah. of, I've always been kind of, um, Little myth sometimes of fans, like they'll use like one little uh, thing in a movie and just dismiss it completely. And that kind of yeah. bothers me sometimes because, yeah, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and frankly, most of the Bond films have something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, some some are a little more egregious than others, but yeah. For sure. Um, and, it's, and this one is sort of weird because, again, as frustrating as, you know, I mean, we'll, get, we'll just, let's talk about it, the Tarzan, y'all. Um, what's weird about that to me is I feel like it's, it's, it's a blight on an otherwise nearly flawless film, as opposed to other films where the, the, the jokey tone just runs deep, you know, yes. like, you know, like, like this one is like, if you, if you pluck that out, like if I, li- I could literally do like an edit of this film and just edit out the goofiness of, of that. Um, I mean, it, all of the goofy parts at least I, at least that I can think of, all the goofy parts happen in that otherwise great scene where they're doing the hunt, you know, where Bond is the prey. It is I mean, a, little, a great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think it is a little jarring that Tarzan yell, but I, I don't know if you recall your theater experiences. It was you know for for both of us it was many years ago, but I remember yeah. that getting laughs, you know, and uh, it kind of yeah, worked. Yeah. It kind of worked in the context of it back then. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, again, I yeah, and I feel like every time we talk about the the goofy, you know, slapsticky kind of jokes that are in the Bond films, you know, I, I kind of feel like nine times out of ten, the I'm sure it was a chuckle the first night. I'm sure people laughed the first night, but then like <laughs> twenty years later, you're like, oh. Good lord, you know. Yeah, um, I, I think a lot of times, a lot of movies do that. Like they'll be like, "Oh, they're gonna, you know, the fans are gonna love this on opening night, you know, or opening weekend." 
and yeah. uh, e- even if it's um, ill-advised, you know. But so anyway, yeah. So I, I you got the Tarzan yell. It's there. Like I said, if I if I could do a little home edit, I could probably take that out, and and that scene would probably be really tense and and the way it's supposed to be. Uh, with that said, with that out of the way, I again I think the film is phenomenal and honestly i think it has a structure that surprisingly most of the films i don't think any of the films that i can think of really have a structure the way this one is um and what i'm referring to is the way the mystery is set up because the way the film opens well first of all we probably could talk about the pre-titles yes which Another one that I think is spectacular. Oh yeah, it is it's phenomenal. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's a it's a great standalone. It's very Goldfinger esque in the way it sort of tells its little short story. Um, it's kind of the tail end of a previous mission or or, or just a you know a self contained mission, I guess. And again, I love it, and I love how it's again the the whole mission is to pl- it's to plant the bomb, and by hook or by crook bond somehow by the end will find a whole different way to blow up that military base so it all sort of comes together at the end so it just it works out great the bond girl in that scene is scorchingly attractive yes you know i mean again i'm a young young 13 year old boy watching this (laughs) it's the best thing ever (laughs) yeah i mean it's absolutely incredible so pre-titles is aces then you get into the the setting up of the mystery, right? And and this is what I love. You open up to, you're like, what am I watching? You see a clown running through the, the woods at night being chased by not one but two knife-throwing twins. Um, they murder the clown. The clown stumbles into the embassy and drops the egg. And so we as the viewers are like, what's that about? Like, we have no idea what that's about. And that sets the whole thing in motion. So, you know, from there it becomes this, you know, following clues and doing whatever to the ultimate payoff of the story, which which is, A, you find out who the, the twins are. You find out how they're involved. When James Bond comes up against the twins, you now see what how this confrontation could have, uh, uh, you know, transpired in the beginning. When James Bond puts on the clown makeup, you start to go, Oh, just like the guy in the beginning. Now, that guy was infiltrating the circus. Now I get it. And not only so so not only does that sort of earlier mystery come together and become revealed toward the end, but it also converges at the the pinnacle, the 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 moment where this is I mean, this is the climax of the film. It's the ticking clock and James Bond has to defuse this bomb. And he's come all this way, and he's, I mean, he's he said the hitch. I mean, the, the, the scenes of him just trying to make his way back to the base is awesome. Like, I love all that stuff. Uh, so, again, so now all points converge at this moment, and it's it's one of the most intense. I think it's easily the best use of the ticking clock I've seen in the, in the, the series. Everyone is watching this moment with bated breath. And it's just tremendous. I love all of that. And I, I kind of don't know why a lot of the, I mean, most of the other Bond films, again, you know, you know, they figure out who the bad guy is in the first few minutes in the office. What about Zorin himself? Max Zorin, impossible. He's a leading French industrialist. You know, again, I, I, I find that this structure is so awesome. And I, I don't know why they don't do it more often. But like here, it's aces. And I'll take a breath from gushing for a second. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree with all your points. You know, I, just to back up there, when the twins are chasing uh, 006 at the beginning, it's dressed in the clown makeup, mm. you know, they, they also hold that, too. I mean, they don't let you know it's twins right away. Um, yes. And, I, and uh, I thought maybe it could hand, that, could have, that yes. surprise could have been handled maybe just slightly better, but it, for what it is, it's great. You know, just the, the, the reveal of that and so forth and those two guys together chasing them. Um, yeah, and that, and that's a great mystery too, because uh, like you said, it um, it intrigues you, and you want to know what happened. Yes. You know, it's not like um, 
well, I don't want to spoil for like a later film where, um, what about Zorin himself? Max Zorin, impossible. He's a leading French industrialist. It, it, where it becomes all exposition, you know, and it's just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, this is a, dr- a dramatic way to get your story across, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I mean, it, it really does. It pulls you in and says, and and sort of th- like it just sort of drops this in your lap, and you're like, okay, I want to know more. I want to know yeah. why this happened. What 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 is this that I just saw? And I also like in this film that they let Bond be Bond. Um, uh, yes. Because I'm going to, uh, I got some serious issues. Well, later on, we're, we're going to talk about uh, View to a Kill in our in our next episode. <laughs> um, and I have some, well, anyway, not to spoil anything. But um, I think that uh, there's some great Bond moments here. And that's important mm. for these films, you know? You got to have your Bond moments, you know? Yeah. And, uh if they're few and far between, it's a disappointment. And but uh, this movie has it in spades. Yes, yeah, I agree. And honestly, we're we're still sort of coming off. I mean, you heard me gush last week, two weeks ago, about *For Your Eyes Only*, and I said that really hit this kind of peak. And I feel like that peak absolutely, positively continues into *Octopussy*, and and in some ways even better. Um, and you know, one of the things you said, let Bond be Bond. There's a lot of that here. There's a lot of kind of lifestyle moments. Yeah. And one of the thing one of the things I think this movie does superbly is it works with Moore's age. Yes. As opposed to you know what I mean? As opposed to having him do things and again we'll talk next time about <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah. No, yeah. Where his his age is obviously his Achilles heel. Uh here they really, really do hit that sweet spot with this one. First of all, like as an example, the scene where he's in Sotheby's, right? I love I find that scene. That to be, it's such such a good scene. First of all, that is classic Ian Fleming, and I've kind of made this point in other uh, reviews talking about some of the other films. Uh, when when you see Bond going after a foe on the golf course or across the card table. Again, it's a battle of wits, and and it doesn't have to be guns and fists. You know, that's yes. not the only way you go against an opponent. In in Fleming's stories, there was a lot of very interesting ways that Bond had to take on an opponent, and one of the ways was at Sotheby's in an, at an auction house, and he's having a battle of wits with this guy who's sitting over there. I don't know who he is, I don't know what he's up to, but I know he wants something, and I'm gonna, you know, go after him, and I love that scene. And so not only is it not only is it spectacular just on on its surface level, I love the little switcheroo with the the egg, how he kind of, you know, does the little, you know, he takes the original and leaves the fake one. I mean, that is pretty amazing. And I love the fact that it kind of stands stands up to scrutiny because that's one of those moments where. You know, when you watch it, like, yeah. it's, it's one of those times when you watch, go back and watch it, like, over and over and over. And you kind of go, all right, wait, did he really do it? Did he really do it? Well, I mean, you can probably tell he probably didn't, actually. But it, but it goes all the way down, comes all the way up. So, I mean, you can see where yeah. it would have happened. Um, so, I love that, too. But, again, but, but just the setting alone, I feel like this is kind of where a, a more mature, seasoned Roger Moore would would sort of fit right in. So I, I, I kind of find that even is again playing to his age in a, in a in a correct way and taking advantage of his age really. You know what's great about that Sotheby scene as well is Louis Jordan and the sort of yes. like his silent smoldering as you know as you know yes. Bond is bring, you know bringing the price up. Uh, he's yes. I think I think Louis Jordan is terrific in this film. Yes, he really yeah. really is, and I I think we've also gotten into discussions before about. Uh, the best Bond villain to, to sort of play off a particular yeah. Bond in a certain. Uh-huh. I find Louis Jordan to be the almost the perfect one for Roger Moore. Oh yeah, he's it's, it's perfect you know I mean? for Roger Moore. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, I mean he's kind of again he's it's almost like these guys both older, both kind of you know comfortable. They're kind of playboys a little bit, you could say. Right. Um, and Louis Jordan is just kind of like a little more sinister version of that. Yes. And. I find that to be like when when the two of them are kind of bouncing off each other across the backgammon table, 
Like, oh boy, is that good. I kind of find that to be... I, I mean, I really... The only thing I'd say about it, and I'm sure this has been brought up before by others, and but like it's a little too close to Goldfinger at that end. I, I think it's a great way to end it with Gominda, you know, crushing the dice. Yes, 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 yes. But yes. boy, that's like, oh man, that is such a Goldfinger uh, moment there. I mean, yeah. I mean with that, you know, not even thinly disguised. <laughs> but it works for that it, scene. It really does. Is, is, is there... Is it a, is it a, a thin line between homage and ripoff? Yeah, it's it's so close, you know. But it's like you said, it's such a good scene. You, you let him get away with that. It's like, okay, I'm gonna yeah. let you have that one. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that, but again, that's again like that's another great scene. Again, it's a very Fleming esque scene where he's taking on his opponent over a game. You know, over um, it could be a, a poker table, it could be a baccarat game. You know, but here it's uh, backgammon. I think the scene works. It really works well. Yeah. And by the way, then he's he, you have the the moment where he he meets up with Magda, Christina Wayborn's character. Oh, she's I think she's terrific. She is. She's absolutely stunning. She still is, by the way. Um, I mean, she, again, this octopus has got I think one of the it's got some of the best looking Bond women, frankly. Uh, I mean, they're all stunning. Hey, I mean, they Christina really Wayborn, are. Yeah. I mean, when I was. You know, I, I, <laughs> I mean, I was sitting, yeah, I boom, like, boom, boom. yeah, I know. Seriously, like like Charlie yeah. Brown with the little hearts on, above. Yeah, there. I know. I hear um, you. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, she's amazing. But again, I love that he sits down, Sotheby's half a million pounds, and you know, again, that kind of little tit for tat, you know, the little playful banter back and forth. I love the line where awesome. the, she says, um, uh, Carmel, uh, he suggests a trade, the egg for your life. And then Bond replies, yeah. um, <laughs> the price of eggs was going up. Isn't that a little high? <laughs> That's a great yeah. line. Totally. Uh, and then her escape from his um, his room yes. via the balcony. Yes, 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 and yes. it's very elegant. It's, it's not like this crazy fast yes. escape. It's really elegant. And the Barry music just swells up. It's terrific. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think the Barry score... I don't know. If the, I wouldn't call this one of my favorites because there's some, oddly I wouldn't either. I I, I think maybe you know? he might have been on orders because of the Battle of the Bonds thing. Because I think there's a lot of there's a liberal use in this particular film for the James Bond theme. I think they wanted to like slam that home, and uh, yeah. but but it has like you know the all time high as a song and the instrumental are beautiful. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Oh yes, yes, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Right, that's when I think it really shines. Right. Um, but yeah, the scene went when he and her just sitting again. You, your 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 guest is waiting at the table, and then he they goes to sit down. <clears throat> That's a sort of a classic Bond moment. It's almost like I mean, going all the way back to like Miss Taro, uh, where Bond has to yeah. flirt with the he knows she's up to no good, but he has to flirt because right. they're again. And it's another classic moment. He's trying to get information from her. She's trying to get the egg from him. So they're they're again playing off of each other. You know who's who's wanting up who. So great, and then the the romantic scene is great. The music is great, and then like you said, that great escape is just phenomenal. Yeah, and like you perfect. said, it's it's elegant, it's it's acrobatic, but elegant. The music is perfect. Oh, my it's, it's God. almost it's, it's almost it's, it's practically beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. It really yeah, is. Yeah. Oh my God, it is. I mean, the whole it's it is like it is very it's, it's stunning. The whole the whole moment is stunning. Man, I, I I'm gonna gush big time over this. This is gonna be a <laughs> And uh, they really make India look beautiful in this film because I know there is a side of India which is like the you know, the high or there's, there's a lot of poverty, but they actually yeah. shoot the beautiful part of India here, and it looks terrific. Yes, yeah, it does. You know, I I will say this too. I think um, maybe one of the reasons why the film is not as popular as I think it ought to be, um, it could be one of those things where if this is not if the if the location is not your cup of tea, then it's not going to be your favorite. I think when we did um, You Only Live Twice, I said, you know, movie's good, but if you're not a fan of Japan or the, the you know, the Japanese location, well, that that's it, you know, because they, they don't go anywhere else, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I, I but I, I agree with you. I think they do show the nice, posh side of India, the hotel, even Bond just check. I, I love scenes of Bond checking into a hotel. <laughs> I, I really yeah. do. I, I you know again it's just it's that little Bond moment yeah. that just works so well. The location is great. The place is great. Um, later on, when they do a chase and he's kind of running through, and there's like, the, you know, one guy laying on the bed of nails, and one guy, I, I 
I've heard people kind of have mixed feelings on that. I, I think it's fine. I, I like it. It's it probably, uh, like, is that bordering on, like, almost cartoonish? Eh, you know, I don't know. I'm not, it's hard to say. You know, I've seen, I never, I've never been there, so I don't know. I've seen the movie many times in that bed of nails that that guy's laying on. I know it's when, uh, when you see more later on, uh, he, he takes a guy, throws him on his back, and he hits the bed of nails. What did you have, yeah. I could tell you could tell some of them are rubber, you know. Yeah. They, they're kind of bent yeah. and stuff. But it's like because I've seen the movie so many times, you know. Yeah, yeah. They, they don't hide it much, exactly. Yeah, but it was fine. <laughs> you know, it was fine like the first five times, and then all of a sudden I went, "Hey!" <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, I yeah, but I, it, I I love the part when like when he takes the the sword out of the guy's throat, whatever he's got the sword, and, and he once he fights him off. And what what does he say? I, I, like, you better put that back yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I mean, like, like that's per that's vintage James Bond. Yeah. I love that. You know. Oh my god, I love it. Oh my god, I, I, I seriously, that's just like my new favorite. <laughs> you know what's you know what's interesting? <clears throat> um, in 2012, he, uh, here in Atlanta at the Plaza Theater, they showed all the James Bond films at the Skyfall, and they had uh, they had uh, an encore night where you could pick any of the Bond films. For uh, an encore, mm. and they chose Octopussy, and I was like, "Really? That's kind of cool." Wow! Okay. Yeah, can you believe that? Because I, you know, like you said, on the internet, you see all this. You know, well, it's you know, it always comes in at like number twenty or something, or it's like uh -huh. near the bottom of the list. You know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, but it, it's not. It's a it's a great entry into the Bond series. I think Absolutely. I I think I like it because it's also. What makes it different for me is that it seems two halves. The first half is sort of like a bit of a romp, but but in a good way. And mm. then uh, the second half is more of a taunt suspense thriller. Um, but luckily, the two halves do merge and they 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 do fit. So yes, I think that's why I like it. I like the way. I guess what I'm saying is I like the way it changes gears. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And and again, kind of sticking with what I was saying for your, for your eyes only. Um, I love the tone, and there are moments when, like, the tone is so oddly, I shouldn't say oddly, but, I mean, it's, it's so kind of down-to-earth and realistic. I mean, sir, again, you have these sort of over-the-top moments, but then you have, like, when Bond is trying to just make his way to the base and literally standing there hitchhiking. Like, I mean, that scene when the teenagers pull up, and they're like, oh yeah, come on, come on, come on! And they take off without him, and they wave, ah, yeah, you know, yeah. And he and he flips him off. <laughs> like, I love that. I think that is great. I mean, I, again, w what's the big deal about it? Nothing, but it it's just kind of just like a real life moment where again, yeah, like he doesn't, like you, like Bond doesn't just kind of you know wave and some good looking girl pulls over, he slams on the brakes, he jumps in, hey, you going my way? Yeah. Like again, this is a realistic moment. So and he's. Like just stranded in the middle of nowhere. Like there's no music there. He he just has to run down the street. I mean, it's great. We might as well talk about the the lead, um, the Bond girl. And again, kind of going back to how I think they very smartly play to Bond's age. I I, I kind of love the fact that Maude Adams is his contemporary age wise, and th the fact that they have a little history together, I think, might even help a little bit. But I think yeah. the chemistry they have is spectacular. It, it is. I, I love, yeah. you know what I mean? I, I, I love sort of, I love her character. I love her character in this. Very smart, very capable. She's done this whole operation by herself. Um, and Bond comes along. And, like, the theme song is going to now ring in my mind. You know, I, I love the lyrics of the, the theme song for that. I mean, the, the, the theme song, All Time High, has always been one of my favorites. Um, partially, I think... I, Partially, just I think it's a beautiful song. I mean, it plays very well. When Barry uses it for his theme, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I but again, I there is some nostalgia factor. I think that kind of goes along with it because <laughs> it was my first James Bond. <laughs> but but the lyrics to the song, they go so perfectly with the romance on screen that I think it works perfectly. So again, when I when I sort of listen to the lyrics of the song, and then I watch Bond and Octopussy on screen, I'm like, there you go. I mean, this is. Two kind of almost star-crossed thrown in together, but they do fit so perfectly. I mean, they are two of a kind. So yeah, I, I think the connection is very believable. And and I again, I love. I mean, seriously, we had like like I mentioned the the other Bond girls. You had the one Bond girl from the pre-title, 
You had uh, Magda, who he's with later. And both of them, a little too young, a little too out of his league. But but that kind of works because, I mean, seriously, one is his, is his fellow agent. Mm-hmm. So there's the connection there. Magda's trying to get something from him, and once she gets it, it's kind of like okay, goodbye. Like you know, it's not like she's she's not chasing him around like a puppy dog afterwards. She's <laughs> right. Out with him. right. Um, but then he gets with Octopussy, and then it it sort of just works better because again, they they just seem more in line with each other. So it's very easy to believe it. I, I will say this: I love the backstory of Octopussy. I love the way Mort Adams plays it. This is one little. This is probably the part where I get a little critical of the film. Okay. Only because I think that the character of Octopussy is really interesting, but I think woefully underused in the film. Um, I love the build-up to her character. I think it's great the way they build her up. And then uh, she's introduced. She has a couple scenes of Bond. And then she kind of disappears from the movie for a, a good chunk. I mean, she's there, mm. and she's on the train. She's at the circus. But there's nothing really going on with her. And she mm. kind of gets lost in the story. And I understand, you know, the story is not totally about her but i always kind of wish they had fleshed out octopusy a bit more somehow um i i just feel that i feel like there's there's potential there to be like this could have been um up to like a status of casino royale you know with vesper mm. and bond you know it could have been that high of a dynamic but here i'll but, tell you what though i'll give you a counter argument okay i i well, well first of all i i like that they do give her not only do they give her well actually i'll back up a little more the the film is based the film is called Octopussy. There was a book in right. Fleming's Octopussy, right. which was actually two short stories. It was Octopussy and Property of a Lady. Right. Mm-hmm. Property of a Lady is obviously the story. It's in it's the Sotheby's bit and and uh, the auction house. So they worked that in perfectly. And the short story is is the story she tells about um, Major Smythe. Right. De- who, Dexter Smythe. Dex, right, right. Dexter Smythe. Uh, Bond went to arrest him. He actually commits suicide, um, which is what all those book, tough. Actually, it's what all those tough guys did back in the day, like Hemingway and even Pedro Armendariz. You, you know, it's not a way to do. It's not a way to go out, though, man. But yeah, that was that was a tough no. guy to thing to do for a <laughs> while. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and interestingly, in the story, again, he's the, he's the octopus lover. He's living somewhere. Um, I think the way he commits suicide in the book is he actually just kind of lets the octopus. Um, uh, Poison him, oh, that's et cetera. That's how right. it does it. Yeah. So anyway, so they work that into her backstory here. So she has that backstory, the connection with her father. So her and Bond have sort of an instant connection, which works. And then they go on more and they tell a little more of her backstory, where she talks about how she created the circus or her smuggling years, etc. cetera. Uh, to what you said about how she's sort, of, she's sort of removed from the story for a while, that kind of reminds me of Tracy a little bit. Because Bond has the romance with Tracy, and then she yeah. goes away, and then suddenly she reappears right after he's escaped from his glory, and they escape together. And I kind of feel like there's a little bit of that here, where you have kind of the Bond Octopussy romance, and then he kind of the attack on on the Octopussy's uh, island happens, and then he kind of just just takes that opportunity to just sort of vanish, and then they don't reunite until the moment at the circus. Where he's dressed like the clown, he has to defuse the bomb, and he and she jumps in and saves the day because she knows James Bond, she she trusts him, she she believes him. Uh, so I think that again, that I think that is actually like, could she have been a little more involved with the story than she is? Yeah, I, I mean, they, she's not that far away. Like you see her like on the train doing some stuff, and yeah, not, I mean, nothing exciting. But yeah, the but the big getting a massage that moment. <laughs> yeah, right. Well. <laughs> no, uh, no, valid points. Um, I think it works better in Iron Man: Secret Service for whatever reason. Yeah. I know what you're saying. I know what you're getting at. It's a good comparison. I don't know, maybe because it's like a bigger. Th- I think because in Majesty she owns like a big part of that first half of that film, and then she disappears mm. for like a good part of the second act, and then she's back. You know, at the end of the second act into the third. So, so it's a little more jarring. That, that I, 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 I think that it gives her more of a, you get more of her character, you know. By the end, it's not, it's not mm-hmm. as, you're, you're satisfied. You know who she is. Whereas I still think, I still feel like there's more things to know about Octopussy that I don't. You know what's great though? Um, you know, the um, uh, the scene between the, the two of them when they get into, you know, she's kind of trying to get him to join her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and maybe I, it, maybe the acting's a little bit like old school, but it's okay for for what for it is, you know, you know. Yeah, I you know, but I I that's another great scene that I really love. Uh-huh. I mean, I, I I'm a sucker for those moments where Bond kind of does one of those like where he kind of grabs her and plants one on her. Yeah, right. well, that, that's that's great movie stuff, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's it, yeah, it's classic movie stuff. But yeah, but yeah, the 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 dialogue I think kind of works. I mean, I kind of like the idea. Um, this is not. I, mean, a, I, th- I think that was. I think it's. it's I'm not. Um, getting. I don't think I'm uh, blaming the actors. I think, I think it's mm-hmm. maybe the way John Glad staged it a little bit. I find that a little bit. I don't want to be mean here, but it's like a little soap opera, just a little bit. I. I, I, I paid assassin for what I am, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a little, a little bit, yeah. you know. And, and that no, that's yeah. I think that's yeah. perfectly fair. Right. Soap opera is a kind of a good, a good way to put it. It's it is a little melodramatic for, but and I love again, melodrama. I, I, I mean, yeah. I love old films that are like that a lot, but uh, I don't know, it's just a little weird here, a little bit. Yeah. It, it's it's almost there. It's like the almost it's like this almost great scene to me, you know. It's good, you know. Yeah, I, and again, I I can't argue argue with that. I mean, it's it does um, it is yeah, it's, again, a little melodramatic, a little over the top. Um, but again, I kind of feel like, and that it could be totally nostalgia. I feel like I'm watching that with 14 year old eyes, or I'm kind of like, wow, that's how grown ups talk. Okay, <laughs> we are. All you have to say is we are two of a kind, and that's it, huh? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and uh, you know what I love? Um, the follow up to that is that great buzzsaw fight scene. I think um, yes. it's so inventive, and and that's a problem we're going to have with the next film, View to a Kill. Um, is the lack of inventiveness in my personal view? Because like this, mm. this is something like yeah, they're gonna have a fight scene, but they're they're adding a new element, and that's that's cool, you know. That's what yes. you gotta do, you know. Yeah. I'm not saying you have to reinvent the wheel, but you do have to give us something yeah. um, a little different. It, it's it's a, I mean, there are a lot of great moments in this where they are saying to themselves, okay, look, we're, we're, how can we? How can we take advantage of our location? How can we throw some sort of local color into things? So, right, you could have just had goons show up with guns, or you know, and just have a fight, or whatever. That happens in but a view then, to a kill, and with the you know, you and it's just like, right. and it, it's like, yeah, I guess it's okay, you know. But it's like, you know, there's nothing. I've seen this all before, you know, and and right, and better. Exactly. Nothing yeah. new. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right here, that whole buzzsaw thing. I mean, that's really yeah. really cool. Um, and by the way, too, and kind of getting back to what I was saying about how um, they kind of use Roger Moore's age or they don't shy away from it. I like how even in the fight scenes here, like, again, he's sort of, you know, as opposed to trying to be a blunt force, you know, instrument going forward and, and fisticuffs with the, with these bad guys. It's, it's more, you know, he's using their own uh, momentum against them. It's he's he's moving in a much more fluid way, where again he's kind of counterattacking with, the, like so that's why I, I think the, his whole, it's his experience that that kind of takes over at that moment. Agreed, and I think I it's, it's the, one of Moore's better fight scenes. I think, you know, yeah. I mean, e- even when he was younger, I always felt that his fight scenes were just a little clunky. Yeah, he, just, he, he was never really like. I mean, I, I don't think anybody would ever accuse Roger Moore of being a very physical guy. I, you know, he, he right. I, like I, he's even said. He goes. He goes. If they ever say, "Do you want your stunt guy to do it?" He goes, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like he, he's never he's never been one to to, to want to do his own stunt. Right, you know? right. He he's never been a, a particularly athletic guy. He's always been kind of a, a man of leisure. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I I saw. So I, I mean, it's it's amazing that I feel like in a film where he's again showing his age and, and he's much older, the fight scenes seem to be choreographed much better and and kind of work with him. So again, just smart on John Glenn and the filmmakers for this because they seem to know you know again he's older but let's let's take advantage of that or, or use that correctly there was something I meant to say when we were talking about for your eyes only but it's just as valid here um, you know I've always sort of given Roger Moore um, two points of credit that I, I think people can't really deny um, one of them as I said I think it was back you know when we were doing um, uh, his first view, and I said, you know, he he was the lightheartedness of the Roger Moore films and his charm. It carries the series through a time when audiences are not clamoring for gritty spy dramas like From Rush with Love, etc. But the other thing that is amazing to me about him is that 
usually when the series or when the franchise wants to kind of course correct and things are kind of getting a little too silly so they want to get a little more down and dirty it usually happens when they bring in a, a different actor Roger Moore is the only time I can I can think of where he's able to do the silly over the top fun movies but then when they want to switch gears and get a little more yes green, he can do that too yeah it's and, and pretty good no man yeah yeah you know what I mean? Like, no one flinched. No one... Uh, he, he does For Your Eyes Only and then again an octopus. And, and he's got he's got fun moments, but he's got serious moments. And, and he's believable in both. I mean, he, he was always self-depreciating, but um, the guy was a total yeah. pro. Um, and you watch, like, you know, he had a lot of experience. You know, he did uh, many seasons of The Saint and um, he did the, mm. uh, the, the Persuaders. And a lot of television and film work before he, you know, starred in Live and Let Die. So, uh, yeah, he had a hell of a lot of experience. And I think it uh, serves him well in these later films, too. There's um, a way that they dole out exposition here, which I think is terrific. Um, Bond's um, a prisoner in the palace, but he's got that uh, pen that Q gave him, which yes. he's able to melt the bars and get out. And then he's got he's listening in for the bug on the Fabergé egg. That's a great way to get exposition out because... Bond's listening in, but he can't quite hear everything. And then um, uh, uh, Magda's using the hairdryer upstairs, so that it interrupts yeah, yeah. with the signal. And so, you know, Bond has to go to the door and listen and so forth. Yeah. That's a way you want to dole out exposition where the audience want all of a sudden. Now they're really curious to what the, what these guys are mm. saying inside. Yes. And that's such so much better um, than like what we'll get in the next film. Um, the way, which is like where the exposition is just doled out in one scene and it's supposed to be good, you know? Yeah, and yeah. it's like, wow, yeah, no. Yeah, I, yeah. Listen, I'm with you too. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. Uh, I like the fact that they only give you sort of just enough to give him something to work with. Right. It's like, you don't want to dole it all bit. out. You know, you want to keep, yeah. you want to have part of a mystery going on too with, with yeah. any film, even if it's yeah. a romantic I, comedy, you know? Yeah. yeah. And by the way, this, this also stemmed from a great, again, very Dr. Noish moment where... Yeah. He, He's invited to dinner. He has to wear a black tie. Oh, I wanted to ask you, know, you about that dinner because this is a year before Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom where they have that, right. that banquet feast. I always wondered <laughs> yeah, if yeah. they kind of saw this and say, hey, let's do that by times 10, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe. It's possible. Maybe. It's possible. Here's yeah. a little trivia. You know the uh, when he takes the eye out and eats it? Yeah. Do you know what that is? I, I know it's supposed to be stuffed sheep's head. I guess it's a hard-boiled yeah. egg. I don't know. It's a hard-boiled egg. Don't oh, you? okay, okay. Very good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we first arrived in India. That is that little, neat little ch uh, chase scene, which is more, more, more of the rompish, and that's where they kind of do all the, uh, yeah, the, the funny uh, um, yeah. little jokes. They kind of get – it's weird. It's kind of the movie gets it out of its system, and then it's done with it in a way. Yeah. I, I, well, after the Tarzan yell. But after that Tarzan yeah. yell – it's pretty much I, after I, that. It's pretty much just got the right tone, right? You know, for the rest of the film. Yeah. yeah. It's so funny how the how the the awkward, goofy, jokey stuff. I I swear I could I could like do an edit of this movie, and just take, <laughs> pluck those little things out, and I th I like it could be just joke free, and I don't think anybody would ever know the difference. You know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, honest, otherwise, that scene is great. I love the fact that they're they're doing a chase on these little tuck tucks. That's right. And see that you know? that's another example of doing it where there's something a little different. And yeah. uh, you know, I've never seen a chase with one of those. And it's uh, you know, it's the Bond crew, the old school guys, you know? and it's spectacular. You know, taking advantage of the location. Yeah, I mean, you would see these things all yes, over. Yes. Moving forward over the film, I love the train stuff. I think the train stuff is great. Yeah, I love it all. The the stunt work, the tension. Uh, yes. the, the action. Oh, uh, so, sometimes people, um, I noticed in this, uh, they, they really, they, they have a big problem with Stephen Burkhoff and his uh, portrayal of uh, General Orloff. I like it. Um, I think he does come in over the top in that very first scene, but he's, he's he has to have a certain bravado because he's just, mm. I, I think, see, Burkhoff is a very smart guy. You know, he's a, he was a playwright and an actor. And I think he realizes what he's giving there is just kind of sort of an exposition. So he's kind of playing it big, you know, just to, yeah, yeah, to make yeah. it more interesting. Um, and it's up to, you know, that being said, it's up to John Glenn to say, no, Stephen, you know, you're going a little too, you know, just down a little bit, you know. So yeah. if that performance is in there, that's John Glenn approved, you know what I'm saying? Or, Al, or Albert Broccoli approved, whatever. So yeah. a lot of times, like, people pick on the actors, you're picking on the wrong person as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, unless the actor's, you know, running really running the show, um, yeah. then, yeah, it's the director that should be... Um, 
called default. But um, mm. yeah, but then later on, I think once he settles down into the role, I think he's great. You know, I, I think he is a, a spectacular actor. I mean, yeah. it's funny that he and then, I mean, he was the bad guy of the eighties. And, and, and yeah, he shows I up. Mean, I think I think it was a year later he showed up as the bad guy in Beverly Hills Cop, which he was terrific in. Yeah, yeah, and he also was the bad guy in Rambo. Yes, yes, very and very right. memorably in that too. Yes. This guy, in, in a few short years, he took on James Bond, Axel Foley, and Rambo. Yeah. Um, but, I, yeah, I, I actually think he's great. I think he is another kind of unsung uh, part of this film. Uh, yeah, he, because... I, again, the opening is a little is over the top, but, I mean, not, probably not nearly... See, I, I like the fact that... See, it's almost like if, if you compare him to, like, a Drax, where he's very subtle and understated, but the plot is sort of over the top i kind of almost feel like they, they here they kind of meet in the middle where the plot's a little more realist, realistic and he's a little little over the top so it kind of almost comes together a little bit better yeah and if you knew nothing about this movie going in and then that he would seemingly seem seem to be the main villain at that point you think oh well this guy must be the yeah. you know the villain of the piece but he's really you know he's really just part of the spokes and the wheel yeah. you know uh, yeah, right, and it's and it's interesting too because when you get into, I, I notice that when some of the films try to get into sort of ensemble villains, it, it can it can be tricky. Yeah. Uh, but here I think it works because you kind of I, I find that you have two strong villains with with two distinct motivations that come together to to form you know again they join forces because they have you know similar interests and it kind of works. It does, yeah, and uh, and incidentally, by the way, his his demise at the border, I like that a lot too. That to me is kind of like that's a taste of that classic spy stuff. Yes, yeah, Cold War, machine gun down right at the border, uh, and it's you know, I, it's uh, ironic that he was shot by his own troops. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, where, where East meets West and everything. Mm. I mean, it, I, it's I, I like that a lot. I also like um, his uh, his mad uh, chase in the car when he's trying to beat the train, you know, to try to yes, get there. Yes, yes, yes. And they de- they decide to go with not hearing his voice, but just showing him, you know, in the car screaming. I think yes. that's really effective and and well done. I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. So, I mean, honestly, seriously, John Glenn. I mean, he's. I kind of feel like he kind of gets lost in the shuffle sometimes, but. He's a, an extremely capable director. Oh, absolutely. Sometimes absolutely brilliant as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you, by the way, I met John Glenn. I remember you Lord. telling me, yes. And I'll tell you, actually, and this is going to, I'm glad I, I'm glad you sort of reminded me of that because I, when I talked to him, uh-huh. his responses to what I was saying surprised me because I, I met him at the Honor Majesties, he was second unit director for Honor Majesty, so he was at the big celebration. I went over to him and talked to him. Could not have been nicer. Super nice guy. Uh, and I and I said to him, I said, you know, I, I love your work and everything. And he said, I, he asked me, he said, what's your favorite? I said, Octopus is my favorite um, of the John Glens. And so and 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 I and I said to him, Octopus to me is the most Hitchcockian. Of, of the Bond films, I think it's got a, a flair of Hitchcock, and I'm I'm thinking that I'm f- really flattering him, and he but and he said you know he liked it, he said thank you, and then he said and he goes, you know what I really like about Hitchcock it was his humor, and I really like the humor and his and I remember and I was sort of laughing because I'm like, you know I I was thinking I'm I'm flattering him by downplaying the humor in in the, <laughs> some of his movies. Hey. <laughs> almost, to, almost to where I, I st- like I had my own theory that maybe the humor was not even his his doing. Maybe somebody else said you got to throw in a couple of jokes or right. whatever. Right. Nope, John Glenn likes the jokes. That <laughs> <laughs> so, Tarzan, yo, man. He, he, he's, I wish I could remember the conversation better because he actually said humor twice. Where I was like, I thought I was steering him away from that idea, and he was like, no, <laughs> well, Then I think you went, you have a good evening, huh? <laughs> <laughs> It's great to see Bond. Like you know, it's great that idea. I mean, it's it's kind of ludicrous, but but terrific. You know, his tires get blown out, and then he's able to travel on the tracks on the train. Yeah, catch up to it. And you know, you can tell the the film is a little sped up and so forth. But it's just so much fun, and the the notion of it is great. Yeah. You know, so see, I I like that a lot. And honestly, I kind of feel like see again, 
it's it's I like it when it's kind of ludicrous, but ludicrous because it's kind of happening in the real world. Yes. Like if that happened in Moonraker, you wouldn't even have blinked. The fact <laughs> yeah. That it's happening in yeah. this movie ma- makes you kind of go, "All right, you're, you're kind of getting a little little ahead of yourself there." But I I feel like it works. I feel like it works pretty well. I think it was someone. I I I wish I could remember who said that had this quote, but and I'm paraphrasing, but. It said, you know, Bond films are its best when they go, when they venture a little bit into the improbable, but not the impossible. And yeah. that's and that's a good way, I think, a good rule of thumb for any anyone that's maybe writing a James Bond novel or a screenplay, you know. Absolutely. You've got to kind yeah. of keep that in the back of your head, you know. Yes, and I think that's a great way to sum this part up. I think that's improbable, but not impossible. Yeah. The fact that it actually sort of happens. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I, mean I, I feel like if you could look at it, you see the car, you see it on the tracks... It's happening. Like I mean, it's not. There's. They're not CGI in that car under the tracks. So yeah, right. It, it, it's playing that line of, of highly improbable, but I'll buy it. You know. Yeah, and and that's the thing. I mean, there's so much stuff in this film. Um, there's uh, interesting characters, great action, um, uh, great act, yeah, great, great everything almost. And it's just a. Uh, it's it's a terrific uh, film. It really is. Yeah. And, Honestly, I. I I almost find that one of the best parts of that is Stephen Burkhoff stopping, looking at the car, and he just turns his head like almost like this this crazed look of he can't believe what he's seeing. And he just goes, "Follow that car." <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Like, yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's also great and his uh, the when he meets his demise and he hits the ground and he's like he's still trying to get to that train. He's crawling. Yeah, and it's like it's just like he, oh, he, he just wants to he wants to get on that train so bad, but yeah. <laughs> Just and, not giving up, yes. Yeah. Oh, my God. Such a good scene. What do we think about the finale? I think it's terrific. You know, somebody said, you know, <laughs> that Octopussy has more climaxes than a porno. And I, it, it kind of does. You know, you, <laughs> you got your, you got your, you know, the bomb and then the, the attack on the palace. And then you go, no, it's not over yet. We're going to the plane. and mm-hmm. Which is actually yeah. the, the stuff in the plane, believe it or not, was the first stuff filmed. Mm. Um, which is interesting. I was like, wow, you got this. Wow. If, if the movie completely sucks, we got this great ending. <laughs> you know? Right. right. We got some great footage yeah. of the stunt and, guys. And by the way, I, and I, I do kind of like the, I, you know, it's kind of the same thing I said for um, The Spy I Love Me. I like it when the climax kind of escalates a little bit. And we kind of have like, again, like several peaks before the, before we're done. Uh, and this one's a great example of that. that. You're absolutely right. That plane sequence is terrific. <laughs> And I also love just even before that. I love all the the octopusy aerobatics, her and her uh, her team infiltrating uh, Carmel Khan's yeah. palace, and uh, that's all great stuff, you know. And I, I love yeah. there's like one moment where the music comes in, and then you see the girls all flipping, and it's like it's kind of mm-hmm. an exciting moment in the film, you know, yeah. where everything's kind of coming together, you know. Yeah, I yeah I like that a lot, and I like the. I think I like the idea of it a lot more than I like the execution. <laughs> okay. Because I, I think that um, almost sort of going in with what I said about how I, I thought they 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 worked with more perfectly, where, again, his his movement was much more fluid, it's edited well, etc. Um, there are moments here where I'm kind of like, mm, yeah, could, that could have been edited a little bit better. I, some I, of the girls are kind of just doing stuff yeah there's like one girl like you see and you can tell she's like probably never not very acrobatic and she's just sitting there punching one of these guys but kind of pretending (laughs) to do it it's kind of like in the background you know you probably know what i'm talking about you know (laughs) yes i do i know what you're talking about it's right here yeah there's there's some there's there's some very awkward moments in that but uh and and also a little editing could have fixed it also his like his swing from the balloon to the balcony is not it's it's they edit yes. it and you're kind of like okay that didn't work but let's all right let's get on with the movie you know <laughs> yeah. yes right there's a little little magic of editing there yeah. to kind of sort of make that work <laughs> by the way speaking of that that's ox that's actually also one of my favorite Q moments i like the fact that this film has a nice full-blown Q scene in the middle yeah you know, we see a couple of gadgets in the background and then um, the latest Ron liquid crystal here. tv <laughs> there you go Perfect image. Yeah. yeah, and then he goes, "Yeah, would that be allowed? I don't think that would be allowed nowadays, huh? You're not gonna have, uh, uh, no. you know, Daniel definitely Craig not. zooming in, all uh, right? No, definitely not. <laughs> um, but I like how Q shows up later, and it's, I mean, and not to fast forward, but you know, License to Kill. One of my kind of crumbles is I feel like they don't u- use Q in a very authentic way. Here, I think he's very authentic. Where, again, he's kind of, you know, 
it's the same old Q, doesn't like being in the field, but you put him in a situation where my other good guy got killed off, I'm by myself, Q jumps in to help out, I love that, I think that's great, him driving the, um, or steering the, the balloon, etc., and, and kind of has a little moment where he steers in and takes out one of the guys on the way down, love that, that's, that's really good. I'm going to give, this might, see, you know, given my past scores and what I've given, you know, uh, other films, I'm going to give po- uh, Octopussy a solid eight. Um, it's it's a great film. Uh, it has a lot of great stuff. The only thing I'd say about it is that the, the main title uh, character of the film, Octopussy, is give it a little bit of the shaft in the movie. I don't, I, I mean, she has some great scenes, um, but she kind of disappears. And she's such an interesting character that I wish I could have seen more of that. Um you know, it's almost hard for me to give this an eight. I'm, I'm almost like hitting almost a nine, but um, I think eight is good. It, it's um, it's it's a great film. Uh, I, I'd say, yeah, I guess I I didn't I don't care for some of the way they handled the um, some of the the melodramatic scene. I felt that was a little awkward and stilted, and it's kind of a shame because it's an important moment in the film. Um, but yeah, I think I give this film a solid eight. Um, I'm kind of having a little personal victory. I think this is the first time <laughs> in the history of doing these reviews. Okay. I'm scoring it higher than Scott. Wow. Look at that. <laughs> um, I'm giving it a nine. Okay. I'm close. I'm close. A, I'm, not gonna, tremendous... I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to nine's door right there. There you go. Mm-hmm. I, I nudge out just a little bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it's, I think this is, like I said, a tremendous film, and honestly, I, I think it's just shy of being flawless, uh, like a, a, a flawless James Bond classic adventure. Uh, just a couple little things here and there I would have done a little bit differently, um, but it is stellar. It has all the things I want in a James Bond film. I think the tone is just right. So when things get, they hit that sort of improbable level, it's still believable. Uh, it's got the exoticism, the romance that I like, uh, exotic locations, good life. I mean, all the good stuff that makes a Bond film unique uh, and not just a generic action film uh, with the action still being great. So, and again, I, I, I still fall back on this idea that the, the structure, that mystery that is set in place in the beginning... Boom! Just aces, and I and I really wish they did more of that, um, as opposed to getting called in M's office. I think he's the bad guy. Go get him. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a nine, and frankly, I think it's just shy of possibly being a perfect ten. But I'll give it a nine. First thing that came to my head was Tarzan yell. <laughs> so I'm gonna say that I was kind of almost thinking about that. The octopusy scene, but it's not my least favorite part, but not by far. Um, yeah, that Tarzan yell thing, it's just a little awkward and out of place. I mean, like, I know it was funny in, in, back in the day, and it still is to a degree, but it, it kind of spoils the, the, the tension and suspense of that scene. And I know this is supposed to be, like, a fun part of the film, but, yeah, we could live without that. I, I can't argue with that Tarzan yell. In fact, it, it sort of makes me wonder. I wish they had, like, you know, like an opening night edit with all the uh, the goofy jokes, and then they'll do like a like okay, now that that's done, here's the real version <laughs> of the film that goes on the Blu-ray without all that stuff. For my least favorite part, I, I I'm tempted to go with the same thing. Uh, in terms of though, what I would do differently to try to fix, or just you know what I would have done a little differently, um, the the attack on Octopussy's Palace, the girls. Um, Again, it's a little awkward in a lot of places, and there's moments where it just feels like the um, the run, jump, and throw like a girl Olympics. Uh, a little tweaking, a little editing probably could have fixed that, and uh, probably that's what I would have done. Like a couple different camera angles, a little quick editing could have just, you know, not left them out there so so poorly. Um, the little tweaks here and there could have fixed that. I'm gonna go with uh, um, Magda. Going out the balcony. I don't know. I just really love that. <laughs> I, and I was going to say, like, you know, that acro jet, which is awesome. I mean, it's it's the coolest thing. And that's a great, that's a great sequence. But I just love the, I just love the, 
the uh, the way the way it moves and the way it's choreographed, even the sound of her fabric as it's as she's coming down the balcony, and the Barry score. I just love that whole part. <laughs> Sometimes it's just the simple things. I it's hard. It really is hard to pick just sort of one thing, and I'm really tempted to kind of just talk about again that opening mystery of the 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 two knife throwers chasing the clown through the through the night uh it's such a great thing and it really does set the whole mystery in motion and i i really want to sort of prop that up as being the thing about this film that kind of sets it apart uh but if i have to go with one scene i'm gonna go with the sotheby scene and again it's it's a very understated moment but honestly it really is kind of that perfect there's that scene to me encapsulates so many good things. Uh, the use of the Fleming story, again, Bond doing battle in a in a very different sort of uh, in a different arena. Uh, I I just love that, and and again, the fact that I think Roger Moore sort of just looks so incredibly comfortable there, really shows how they're using using his age and experience uh, to the to the to their benefit. Uh, it just works so well. So um, I'll give it to that one. Octopussy. Again, no secret that it's uh, a big one on my list. One of my, easily one of my favorites. And um, so another good one, my friend. Yeah. And uh, I like it almost as much as you do, but we're short by an one octopusy hair. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you're not going with that, are you? <laughs> I, 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 I outdid Scott. I, I went. I, I got a higher score than him this time. I, I think I you know. I think this. You know, you're gonna. Know, I think you're gonna start noticing a trend. <laughs> I, I, I thought I was gonna have to wait till the bras in years to actually uh, yeah. uh, outscore yeah. you, but uh, it happened. So yeah. yeah. All right, my friend. Thank you again, and I will uh, see you here next time. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Always a great time. Good spot.